And my father was a big fellow, he was about six foot four, strong. And my mother was a five foot barely and a hundred pounds probably or less. And then I had an older brother and myself and a younger sister. My parents were in business. Uh, they were, uh, uh, my father was a baker and he owned a little, little old bakery and he had a few people working for him. About twice a year, he would put on a little, <laughs> a little party, um, for, um, invite a bunch of friends, uh, make a bunch of homemade brew <laughs> and some homemade wine, and take a, 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 a porker and a lamb side by side, all dressed up and seasoned, and stick it in the baker oven and bake them together. And come around, the friends come around and rip the meat off <laughs> and uh, drink the little wine and beer and sing. And singing was always uh, loud singing, you know. And my mother would play the piano and they would have a ball. Warfare. These pictures of the preparation for attack and later the actual combat were all made by German frontline cameramen. Therefore, they stress Nazi superiority. Success is unimpeded as Hitler's divisions move against outnumbered Polish defenders. Later, when they came after us, my brother and myself, and they loaded us up in those boxcars, and uh, when we talk about boxcars, you had to be anybody that had to be a ever in Europe to see the size of them. They're so much smaller than you see in America, you know. And they would shove a hundred of us in there. And, and to this day, I don't know how many days and nights we were in there traveling, park traveling, and the boxcar never opened up. No food, no drink, no nothing. Until we finally arrived in this place that I really didn't know what this place was, you know and that was Auschwitz. Auschwitz was, was taken over and it used to be an old military base or something. <clears throat> that's why the kind of brick buildings, you know, that's old Auschwitz. I guess they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't have no room for us or whatever. And that's when I lost my brother because he, he got sick right away, uh, diarrhea, terribly bad. And he uh, couldn't be propped up even to stand up when the one of those two uh, lined up to be counted. There was no place to go. The barbed wire already was energized. And, and when we could not prop him up, me and my other friends, you know, prisoners there, uh, they, they shot him beside my feet. I think that was that was the killer to me too. I mean, right there, it, uh, it just hurt me terrible, terrible, bad, bad, because I was so close to him, you know, and he was my pride, you know, a, an officer in the military, you know, and strong and handsome and everything, and loved him. And when they killed him, uh, I just. The good Lord must have wanted me to live because when he uh, segregated us, uh, picked us over like cattle, uh, lined us up, and you go right, you go left, you know. And when I went to the left and the others went to the right, the ones that went to the right uh, march, was marched off, and there's a forest right close by there. Uh, Auschwitz is circled by a forest, you might say. And you could hear the machine guns, the fire, you know, and all those people were killed right there and then and buried in mass graves. And the ones that went to the left, like myself, received our numbers, you know, tattooed in my left arm. And uh, I then decided, I'm, I just saying to myself, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna, I'm gonna survive.
in the beginning, Poland was the first country, you know, to be invaded. So in the beginning was, uh, was all Polish practically in Germans, in Germans. There were German people there uh, that were anti, or at least that's what they were accused of, being anti-Nazi, anti-Hitler were brought there. Uh, but then as the, the war went, was going fast, then Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary, just Albania, country after country, then France, Belgium, Holland, and all you needed to do is just uh, listen to the language you know the people spoke, and you knew, or you didn't have to, you didn't need no newspaper, you knew where they're coming from. It didn't bother me a bit then, but it bothers me so badly now. The lie. A Gestapo officer would get on a little box. There was a little box sitting there, and he would get on there so it'd be high up. And he'd make a little speech that you have arrived to the labor camp, and the barracks are waiting for you, you know, where you're going to live. But you're all lousy, dirty. you got to be clean first. And for the first year or so, they would even have the people undress and naked here total strangers, several hundred people or a thousand people or whatever from this whole train would be standing naked there. And they would uh, herd them in to the bathhouse. They even, for a while, they even furnished you with a towel and a bar of soap for family. But once they got in there, you know, there was no shower or nothing, no bath. The door was closed and the gas come down from the ceiling. And many a times, 20 minutes or half an hour, the floor would open up. And me and three other men and several other groups just like it, they called us the commandos, we would be uh, working under the gas house to uh, uh, pick up the bodies when they were gassed and the floor would open and drop to the, to the cellar or to the below. And we would pick up the bodies and throw them on the wagons. Our life depended on that we did not throw a body on them with rings on the fingers, gold in the mouth, or hair on the head, especially women you know, in those days, long hair that was all sheared off and great big gunny sacks we had. We filled the gunny sacks full and with hair, knocked the teeth out, put the little box hanging on the side of the the, this flat flat wagon, just like you haul hay or straw you know, on the farm, a ranch. And rings, you couldn't pull off the ring because the hand was twisted. We had this little hatchet, you know. Uh, we took the finger and all, and, and then we would push the wagon over to the crematoriums and drop the bodies there and go back and get another load. I had a lot of hate in me. I wanted to get even for killing my brother right there beside my feet. His blood running out of him, you know, and it just, I have tough times talking about that. And then while I was in there, after two years or so, they brought my father, mother, and little sister there. And I didn't get to see him, but they were also gassed. Camp was closed, and I laid there in the gutter next to next to the barrack. I don't know how I ended up there, but that's where I was. And when Charles Kinney and his orderly room man, a corporal, moved in, came in, and Charles saw me laying there, and he threw me a piece of hard candy out of the carriage, and just hard as a rock, you know, a piece of chocolate. And I was so that I didn't even bother about picking it up. He became a dear friend, and he's told me that many a times. And uh, I didn't bother. And he just got out of the Jeep and just picked me up 
And later on, years, I thought I weighed 87 pounds, and he corrected me several times. No, no, you weighed 78 pounds. Tall as I am today, or maybe an inch taller. <laughs> and he put me in the Jeep, and he says, I had enough. I saw enough. That's his words. And he drove out of there. And this is the man, my angel, the man that liberated me. And this is my other angel, Ed Townley, that brought me to this country. So I befriended all, all, every one of them became just very, very close to me, dear. The best medicine, the best medicine is American soldiers would come by and tap me on the head, tap me on the shoulder, leave me cigars, cigarettes, chewing gum. <laughs> And uh, but the smile and and and, and uh, you know it just I think that gave me hope, uh, life you know, and uh, it, it just it it and I and I in my mind started clearing and I kept thinking my gosh this man's got the same color uniform as the guy just a few days ago was kicking me and hating me and. Same color uniform, same color skin, same color, you know, a little different insignias, different uh, uh, shape helmet, but so I fell, I started falling in love with the, with the American soldier, you know, the GI. Uh, a lot of tears were flowing. I got very emotional because the Townley family just super. Uh, Grandma and Grandpa Townley just hugged me and they said, well, we have a large family. We just increased by one, <laughs> one more. So it, it, it was very emotional and it ended up exactly the way I saw it, uh, because even after my kids were born, that was grandma and grandpa, you know, and just, it, it was wonderful.